There we are. We're live. Hi, everybody. Todd Phillips, RE Journals. I'm our CFO and resident webinar. Uh, failed to call myself an expert, uh, but getting the hang of it here. Thank you for joining us. We've now done seven uh, webinar events. Uh, we were planning on putting on 104 live events in 17 states this year, and uh, that all got put on hold about mid-March. So we're happy to be here via webinar. Don't know how long it's going to last, but we have a lot more planned. Um, I'm going to go through some quick housekeeping items. You will see, let's see, here we are. This is us. Sponsors on the right. I'll thank them in a second. So first off, if you have connection issues above your screen where you see the slides right now is a button that you can use to reconnect. So if you get disconnected, reconnect by hitting that button. On your right, you're going to see buttons for polls and chat. I opened the chat room up already. Uh, so click on your right. You can see if you've got, uh, if you want to put your name, uh, company you work for and state that you're in and say hello to fellow people. If you want to put your contact info on there, that's fine too. Quickly go through and thank our sponsors. Uh, first off, uh, Washington County EDA, Yellowstone Landscape, Grand Ridge Real Estate Capital, Strive, Wilden, and our marketing partners, CCIM, SIOR, MinCar, SITCAR, and IREM. Thank you all for being a part of this. Uh, we're excited to bring this live to about 4,000 people. Looks like the number is uh, 2,500 and climbing by the second, so hopefully everybody's able to log on. If you have other connection issues, we did send out an email just before this started that goes over a couple of other ways to um, get yourself logged back in. Back to my slides. All right, we're going to start with Dr. Dotzer. He's our economist today, our guest. Um, do you want to do a quick brief introduction of yourself? Tell us who you are and uh, all the good things about you. Great, Todd. Hey, for everybody out there, it's good to be with you today. Uh, yeah, my name's Mark Dotzer. I was the chief economist of the Real Estate Research Center at Texas A&M University for almost two decades and uh, five years ago, uh, retired from the university to just do this full time. So this is kind of what I like to do in retirement. Some people like to go fishing. I like to share information with people. So Todd, thanks for inviting me to be a part of the program today. Thank you. Well, let's start off with a uh, quick, uh, we'll just jump right into the questions. We're in the middle of, uh, I'm so tired of hearing the word unprecedented, uh, but that's what, it is. that's what it is. It's unprecedented. We've never had anything like this. So the economy obviously has, the bottom's fallen out. Uh, would you say this is more like a 9-11 uh, or a 2008 economic slump? You know, I've been asked that question quite a bit. And uh, my answer is that it feels like it's a combination of 9-11 and 2008 and World War II, actually. There's a lot of similarities between all three of those events. 9-11 uh, was uh, out of nowhere. There was a lot of fear for a while, fear of the unknown, and it slowed the economy down. We had a recession after that, and then we had kind of a flow period after that. But after a while, the American people got tired of being cooped up and they started to go back to work. They started getting back on airplanes. They started taking vacations again. So it's it's a little bit like 9-11, only it happened not in New York and a couple other areas, but in every city on earth. It's kind of like 9-11 on every city on earth right now. Um, there's some similarities to 2008 as well, because um, in 2008, the financial system uh, had tremors in it, if you will. Foundations were shaking. And uh, just last month, uh, the foundations of the financial system, in my mind, were shaking just as poorly, just as badly as they were in 2008. So we've got that to deal with. The good news is the Fed has tools that they didn't have in 2008 and have started to um, initiate uh, programs to uh, keep it, keep the economy going. And then in, uh, 
it's like World War II in a certain kind of way because we need to mobilize the country. We have a, have a problem with a lack of supplies, medical supplies and places for adults and all the rest of that, ventilators. And that reminds me somewhat of World War II because at a certain point in time, Franklin Roosevelt had to just take command of the entire U.S. economy and tell people that we're going to ration food, we're going to ration tires, we're going to ration clothes. And so I think the president is right in terms of getting the War Powers Act going because he needs to be able to tell people that we need masks and we need respirators and all of that stuff. Do you have another question? Yeah, we're dealing with, uh, now we're up over 3,000 people online. So I want to repeat to everybody else, if you have connection issues, there's a button to, to reset your connection at the top of your screen. Also might want to make sure you're on Google Chrome and uh, you can always log out or close your internet browser and get back on. Also, it helps to be, uh, you know what, I've had the best luck on my cell phone. So if you can't get it on your desktop, you can click on the link from the email we sent and get it on your cell phone. All right, so this is the one that scares me. Um, Thank you for sending the questions in advance. This is a big one that I had. Uh, I remember 2009, and I know that a lot of companies were doing well in 2010, 11, 12, but it didn't feel like it to any of us that were working. Uh, is this going to be another jobless recovery like that? You know, I think it's possible that now that uh, as this gets longer and longer, um, we were getting close to a recession. I would say we were two years away from having a recession before this virus hit. So there were companies that were struggling and probably going to have to uh, lay off people or close locations. And a lot of businesses use recessions as a excuse to close locations and fire people, you might hear the phrase they're throwing out the kitchen sink. And once a, once a company decides that it's um, going to have a difficult, have difficult news to report, chances are they'll throw in the kitchen sink and have all their bad news at once. So I think there is a significant risk. I call it a jobless risk because there's a whole lot of people that could back to work immediately. But uh, I could see a situation where we do have slow, slower job growth than we thought, that it might take a while, maybe even a couple of years before we get employment levels back to where they were uh, in January. So the government's tried in fact, to go a lot. Oh, well, go ahead. Nope, you're good. We're having a little bit of bumpy ride, but here, keep going. Sorry. That. Okay, no problem. I'm used to doing these and they're not easy. The, uh, you guys are doing a great job. Um, we had a jobless recovery after 9-11 too. We, we made it all the way through 2004 uh, with a jobless recovery. And then we had the, the Bush tax cuts, if you remember those. We had Bush tax cuts in 2001 and 2003 to try to recover from 9-11. Then, of course, in 2008, uh, we had a similar sort of slow recovery. Everybody's complaining about a jobless recovery for three or four years. And we had anybody remember cash for clunkers 2009? Anybody remember the payroll tax cut in 2011, which didn't work at all? I remember working at the real estate center with my colleagues and saying, what what's going wrong here? They uh, they've stopped the payroll tax. Uh, payment. And so that's putting money in people's pockets. How come the economy is not expanding? And what we found out later was they didn't spend it. They, they, they saved it. And so those rascals just didn't participate the way the government was hoping they would. So I would expect to see uh, a lot of people want to come back to come back to work that can. But I would also see a slowdown in some of these industries. For example, the hotel industry, uh, the movie theater industry, the tourist industry, the oil and gas industry, these, these industries were struggling 
to a certain extent before this virus happened. And I think people are going to be a little slow to want to go back to the movie theater or go to a NBA basketball game or um, any place else where there's a whole lot of people. So, yeah, I expect it won't be a jobless recovery, but it'll be slow. Go ahead, Todd. Well, so we all know if we're watching the news that the president and Congress uh, passed a gigantic bill, larger than anything we've ever seen before, uh, to the tune of north of $2 trillion. Is that plus the Federal Reserve's lending efforts going to be enough to get us through? This is going to be a two-part answer to that because um, – I typically in my speeches always like to have a title with a with a picture on the describe it. Uh, in 2017, I had a fuel dragster that had fire coming out of it after the tax reform of 2017. Uh, back in 04, I had a beach sea turtle because our, our economy just couldn't do what it was supposed to be doing. It was so slow. Uh, up until about a month and a half ago, I had good fishing ahead, but a few clouds on the horizon. And after thinking about all this for this presentation, I know what my new slide's going to be, and I know what my new theme is going to be. It's called The Whole Creation is Groaning. And what I mean by that, there's four different vectors that I can see that are under incredible duress. The first, this is kind of a chronolo chronological presentation here too of this because the first growth happened in the medical side of things with no medical supplies, not enough, not enough facilities, not enough personnel and not enough medicine or vaccines. And that second, so the medical area is groaning. Households are groaning as they lose their jobs, or get furloughed or get sick and have to postpone life just for an indefinite period of time. The third area that's growing, groaning is the financial markets. By May 18th, the foundation of the entire U.S. financial system was shaking, in my mind, even more than 2008. And the fourth area that is groaning and struggling that we haven't heard a lot about yet is the supply. That's not a very sexy topic, but there's a lot of industrial real estate people on this call, I'm sure. And supply chain is important to everybody. You've got shipping companies that have low rates and empty ships workers and warehouse people at risk of getting sick. Uh, you've got meat packers and chicken plants at risk. The people don't want to go there and work side by side, just like any of the rest of us wouldn't. I know the price of eggs has doubled or tripled in the last couple of weeks, not because there's a shortage necessarily, but the, and with everybody hoarding, it creates a temporary shortage. So the whole country, the whole creation is groaning right now. And why I say that, because that puts it in proportion to see what our federal government's response has been and what looks like an overwhelming response may not be enough in my mind. So let me take a look at that just for fun. Our current GDP is $21.4 trillion. And what our government appears to be trying to do is fill a hole in the economy for at least three months. And so if I took $21.4 trillion and divided that into th up to three months, that's five and a quarter trillion right there just to fill the hole for three months. Now, it won't be that bad because just suppose consumers cut back by 70% and businesses cut back by 80%. That still means that our hole in our economy is about $3.5 trillion just for 90 days. That gets us through April, May, and June. 
Now, the stimulus package that I've seen so far to this point talks about $2.2 trillion. So I'm guessing that's probably not enough. It sounds like an outrageous amount. It's hard to imagine, but in my mind, it wouldn't surprise me if our federal budget deficit and our federal debt easily increase by three and a half to five trillion dollars in this calendar year. And so uh, as I'm talking about that, while it's on my mind for a second, I want to get one other concept out related to the economy. And that's this concept that I feel like is right. The value of a contract has never been lower than it is right now. I think it's uh, interesting because there's a word, I, I didn't take any French. I, I grew up in Kansas, so I never spoke a word of French. But the French phrase is called, it looks like force majeure to me, or force major here in College Station. What does that mean? It's not, the lawyers in the room, exactly what it means. They haven't encountered this before, but it means unforeseeable circumstances that prevent someone from fulfilling a contract. And that's in the back of my mind too, that basically I don't care if you had a contract to sell a million cubic feet of natural gas to Singapore uh, and you got that ship on its way, uh, whether or not they buy it or not, it's a completely different matter. So this is where uncertain term uh, conditions that we're in, it's unprecedented, that's true, but it is for real. And so I don't think the government is over, over responding with what they're doing now. In fact, I think it's probably gonna be not enough. I expect to see more. Go ahead, Todd. Yeah, well, so amid well, all this turmoil. I'll just keep talking. Let's talk about the Fed for, for the last year. Next time we have a recession, which I thought would be in buying treasury securities and mortgage backed securities and drive the 30. Todd, well, I need you to give me a thumbs. There we go. No idea well, if anybody's hearing me. I think you're still playing. I think you had a break there. So go ahead. Okay. And, oh, okay. Go ahead and start up well, again. Well, I, 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 yeah, just as, as we're working this, if you suddenly lose me, uh, give me a signal like cutting your throat or something. So I'll know we're down for uh, that would help. I really appreciate your effort here. This is so hard this. to pull off. Uh, I, want to talk, I want to talk about the I want to talk about the Fed for a minute because uh, I don't know if a lot of people knew this, but somewhere around March 20, March 8, the credit markets basically shut down just as bad as they did in 2008. And so that's why Jay Powell come out, came out and said, we're going to buy bonds, uh, unlimited quantities, uh, which was never heard of in 2008. The reason was is because the whole corporate bond market had shut down. The uh, uh, commercial paper market had shut down and the muni market bond market had shut down, as well as the high yield debt. And so um, I think they're on along about March 19th, the whole credit system had completely frozen up. And that's why Jay Powell came out and said, we will buy unlimited amounts of corporate bonds as well as mortgages and as well as treasury bonds to reopen the bond market and it worked. I mentioned to you how the credit markets were groaning. Well, I think they've been fixed at least temporarily now because the uh, uh, buy bonds from virtually anybody that's in an investment grade status or government security. So with that said, I think the Fed's done a good job of uh, taking care of the enormous distress. I'm calling it a huge disturbance on market that seemed to have peaked on about March 17th. So with that said, 
I'll tell you what, I might just keep going and talk about why this is, what kind of impact. Number one, the Dow, okay, think about this a minute. If you're an investor, you can invest in stocks, bonds, and real estate. How are stocks looking right now? The Dow on February 6th was 29,379. Six weeks later, it's 18,591. The stock market dropped 36% in six weeks. Did anybody's real estate building drop 36% in the last six weeks? I doubt it. That's the stock market. How about the bond market? On December 31st, at the end, by March 9th, it had dropped to barely above a half a percent. But then things went crazy because between March and nine days later, March 18th, the 10 year treasury skyrocketed from 0.54% to 1.18%. That caused a lot of problems. Some financial entities, maybe non-bank financial entities like hedge funds and others, there was some serious financial duress when the 10 year treasury, uh, the interest rate on the 10 year treasury doubles in a matter of nine days. And now, as we said here today, uh, well, April 2nd was the, was the recent number I looked at. The 10 year treasury is at 0.62%. So not only is there enormous volatility in the stock market, but there's also enormous volatility in the bond market and there's no yield there. And so with that said, let me look, let me talk about real estate investment trusts for a minute too. I like real estate. Uh, everybody that's uh, known me for any period of time knows that I've had a substantial investment of my retirement account in commercial real estate, probably since about 2002. But here's why I like commercial, uh, private equity and direct investment in real estate because I just noticed that the Vanguard real estate fund index, that's an index of mutual funds, hit a peak on February 20th at $32.98. And by a month later, it had dropped to $18.94. That's a 42% drop in a month. That's why when people ask me, what's the difference between owning a REIT stock and owning direct interest in properties? There it is. And so with that said, I think this case is going to be just like the stock market crash that happened in 08, just like the stock market crash that happened in 2001. All this is going to do is make real estate investment even more attractive than it was a year ago. The only difference is that yields are going to be much lower than they have been. I, I tell people that, uh, interest rates are likely to be low for the rest of my lifetime. And then I like to tell people, if you don't know me, I may look like I'm 85 years old, but I'm actually only 65 years old in case you're wondering about the duration of my forecast. So with that said, that's kind of my take on commercial real estate. Um, interest rates are, are heading down. I mentioned this in my speeches for the last year or so that when we get into a recession, the Fed has a plan, monetary policy at the effective lower bound. And that's a mouthful, but that's what Fed people get paid to do like that. But what does monetary policy at the effective lower bound means? What that means is when we have a recession, the Fed will cut the Fed funds rate to zero. And then if that's not enough, then they will start printing money, maybe for four trillion, maybe six trillion. We'll see what happens this time around. But they will print money and buy bonds. That's called monetary policy at the effective lower bound. What that means is we're going to get the Fed funds rate to zero and we're going to get mortgages to two and a half percent or lower so that we can allow the entire country to refinance their mortgages at two and a half percent. That's how we got out of the 2008 recession. 
It didn't have anything to do with ca cash for clunker or any other government policies that happened. The policy that worked was the Fed using quantitative easing to buy $4 trillion worth of mortgages and treasury bonds and drive the mortgage rate down to about three and three quarters. And it allowed the entire country to refinance their 5% mortgages at three and three quarters. In my mind, that's the turning point for the growth in our economy. With that same logic, then, I think the Fed knows that happened. And so the trick is everybody already has a three and three quarters mortgage. They're going to have to do something even better than that to get the same bang for your buck, if you will. The Fed is going to have to print money, buy treasuries, buy mortgages, get that 30 year fix down to about two and a half percent and allow the entire country to refinance. And that will put more money back into the pockets of Americans than any cash for clunker thing or any other government policy that's been tried in the 20 years of this century at this point. Borrowing costs are going to be low for a long time. And cap rates are going to be low for a long time too. And so I wouldn't be afraid to borrow money on a short term basis. I wouldn't be afraid to borrow money on a term basis. The only advice I've been giving investors for the last two years, as we started hitting high notes in the market where people were starting to say, wow, prices are so high. What do we do? What, what should we do? And I said, you know, if you buy property now and own it 10 years, I bet you it's going to be worth a lot more 10 years from now than it was today. But the trick is dead on it. And this is coming to fruit right now. There's going to be winners and losers debt levels low enough so that if they have to drop rents by 10% and even when they do that, their occupancy jumps up to 50. And there's plenty of people that have done that. But there's also plenty of people that put too much debt on because they wanted those 15% or 20% IRRs that the, uh, they were bragging about so much. Those are going to lose those properties. Those properties will become distressed assets. And some of my other clients that are in the distressed asset field will buy those properties from their lenders and make all the money in the next, next decade. So again, owning real estate is a good idea. Just keep your leverage low. Um, and while I'm thinking about it, I'll switch gearish for real estate in a big way. Those of you that know me, I had a 70% allocation in my whole retirement account to commercial real estate. I have 0% allocation to commercial real estate as we said here today. I sold half of it at the end of the year and I sold the other half in March, not because I don't like commercial real estate, but with TIAA, which is where my opportunity was, their properties were all in big cities and core properties. And uh, I just did, there wasn't any, uh, there wasn't any growth uh, potential in those big cities for a while. So I wanted to get out of that. So as we said here today, I got actually my whole retirement account now is a hundred percent CDs and fixed income short term stuff. Uh, but I want to own real estate. I, I do own real estate myself through private equity. Uh, and I intend to do more of that in the future. I'm hearing uh, in the real estate business that might matter. Uh, if you, if you kind of feel like I'm a little scattered here, number one, I typically use power slides for my speaker notes. And number two, I just put this speech together about an hour and a half ago after working on it, thinking about it for three days. So if it sounds like I haven't done this before, you'd be absolutely, I know. So with that said, a couple of things. Number one, for those of you that own real estate, you probably already know this, but people out there that don't, who might be afraid to invest in real estate because of a collapse, uh, lenders may be deferring payments on commercial real estate loans for up to three months. So the whole game plan appears to be 
let's, uh, you know, if people are at home and sick and they're closed for three months, let's run a budget deficit of two and a half or three and a half trillion, see if we can hold things in place. And if you can't make your payment, okay, that's fine. We'll let you hang on for three months and then we'll talk about it at the end of three months. That's for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac lenders and maybe some community banks, but not everybody acts that way. CMBS lenders are not known for uh, their willingness to be real flexible with borrowers, as many of you know. So some people that have CMBS loans on their properties, those properties might become distressed assets quicker than other types of properties. The question keeps coming up about cap. What, what's going to happen to cap rates? Well, two things matter. One is the reason I've been saying the cap rates would keep going down for the last 10 years is because I thought that the 10 year treasury was just going to continue to drop. And it has. And I don't know how much farther it can drop from. I'm sure they can get it down to zero, but this is about as low as it needs to get. So, from that standpoint, as the, each time the 10 year treasury falls, it does make sense that cap rates fall with it, but it's not a perfect correlation. And the reason for that is there's another factor involved in cap rates when investors make a decision to buy, and that is the risk associated with the property they're thinking about buying. So in my mind, we've got a downward pressure on cap rates and an upward pressure on cap rates. The downward pressure is the 10 year treasury seems to be heading towards zero. The upward pressure is that for some real estate in particular, the uh, risk is so the perceived risk associated with those buildings has gone up dramatically. I'm guessing that a cap rate on a casino or a hotel, or something related to the travel industry. I'm guessing the cap rates on those are going to go up, even though the 10 year treasuries drop so low because the perceived risk of those properties has gone up a lot. But for other kinds of properties where the risk perceived risk isn't as high, I think cap rates could even go lower. I also feel like the housing market could be really strong. I know the housing market is really strong. Um, I was surprised about this all last year. I was surprised at how sluggish the single family housing market was. It would just didn't make economic sense. We had job growth, we had cheap mortgage money, and we had home price appreciation. All of those are a recipe for a strong housing market. And for some reason, new home sales and new home construction plateaued. And I went around the country saying, I don't understand this. I can't explain it, but it's a fact. It's what happened. And then things changed somewhere after Labor Day. The first I noted was that publicly traded home builder stocks had exploded through the roof. And I wondered why that had happened. So I started looking and all of a sudden I found out that home builders were having a lot of good activity in the marketplace. And all of a sudden home sales started picking up. And so, I, that was super bullish because a turnaround in the housing market is usually the very first sign of a recovery in the economy. It's kind of like the Groundhog Day when the single family housing market wakes up, the whole economy is ready to come out from winter, winter and there was no mistake about it. The single family housing market was picking up and was strong. I think it'll come back. Not everybody's losing their job right now. And so think about the housing market when it finally does open, when we finally get the go signal that you can go outdoors again. I'm guessing that somewhere in June or whenever we get the all clear signal, there's going to be a lot of people come out of their apartment, come out of their house and say, we've been thinking or wanting to buy a house for the last six months. We haven't been able to do it. And the mortgage rates could be two and a half percent. And I, I'm telling people in the home building business and in the real estate sales business, whatever you do, don't take a vacation in June, July and August, because you might do a half a year's business in 90 days. So, if you've got a daughter that's thinking about getting married, just tell her there is no way we're I don't care if you don't like fall colors in your wedding. This is a special year. We got to do it. Um, so I, 
I think, uh, and I, you think about a mortgage rate under 3% sounds pretty crazy, but when you look at history of the relationship between the 10 year treasury and the 30 year mortgage, the average spread over years has been about one and three quarters percent. So what that means is under normal circumstances, the treasury is 0.6% right now. If you add one and three quarters percent to that, that would put a 30 year mortgage, if my math is right, that would put a 30 year fixed rate mortgage at 2.35% today. So I think the reason it's not is because the bond market blew up on March 18th. There were no buyers for mortgage bonds or any other kind of bond for that matter. And if you remember that, uh, the 30 year fixed rate mortgage at the end of February was 3.3%. And the, then all of a sudden the 10 year treasury starts dropping. And then that 30 year fixed rate mortgage, instead of going down, went up to 4%. I knew something was wrong. The day I saw that, it just hit me in the face. Like what has happened here? Why is the 30 year fixed? Why has it gone up to 4%? And the answer is because the bond market had closed down. That was not a real signal. That 4% that mortgage rate was not a real economic signal. It was a signal that the bond market had shut down. Now that the Fed has rolled out their different facilities, including those to buy mortgages, uh, I don't expect that kind of spike to happen again. And mortgage rates are gonna continue to fall. In fact, they fell too fast. Uh, many unintended consequences of these experiments that we're trying get a load of this. So the Fed is dropping the, the 10 year treasury rate, pushing it down, trying to push mortgage rates down. And all of a sudden a call for help came out from the mortgage business saying, Hey, Fed, you got to stop slowing, stop, stop lowering rates so fast. They're going down so fast. We're going bankrupt. Long story, but I won't get into it. They have to have a hedge so they don't get caught if mortgage rates move up or down too much. And the Fed tried to lower rates so fast that it was blowing up their hedges and they were gonna go insolvent. And so the Fed realized that. So I would say now they're still in a trajectory to lower mortgage rates under 3%. They're just gonna do it more gradually so they don't bankrupt and blow out the whole mortgage industry into financial insolvency by moving too fast. So let me talk also about some longer term struck changes that I see might be related to real estate demand in the future. Number one, I expect to see a whole lot more warehouse space built in this country. We're finding out just how bad it is to have one supplier in China and just in time manufacturing an inventory. What that mean, just in time manufacturing and inventory just means that you don't have a warehouse full of toilet paper that might last you 60 days if your customers freak out and want to buy it. That means that toilet paper or those auto parts or those clothes or those shoes or anything else, there's only a week supply or two week supply and we're, we keep it that lean and mean. Well, what happens people buy a five week supply of stuff in a matter of four days, then we're out of business and that's where we are today. So I have a feeling people are going to reevaluate. Number one, do we want to be a hundred percent dependent on China for inventory and supplies? That's already changing. That's happening. That was happening before the virus. So we're going to have more demand, in my opinion, for uh, warehouse space as we have more inventory in our country. I think it's also going to create more positive demand for farmland. Uh, there's a good book. If you're interested in the currency of our country, if you think there's a chance of runaway inflation, which I don't, but a lot of people do, there's a book called The Death of Money. And the author, I got to look, James Rickards. And when you read that book, I saw him on campus at Texas A&M a couple years ago. He's the smartest guy I ever saw about financial uh, matters on an international level and also on inflation and the devaluation of currencies. 
James Rickard in his book says a couple of things to buy and invest in if we do have runaway inflation. Top one was gold, of course, but the second one was unimproved land. And that always has been a good uh, hedge against inflation. And so I would think also that class B and C apartments would also be in demand. Uh, I wouldn't be quite as uh, interested in class A because some of those rents are pretty high and I think some people won't want to afford it. Uh, but class B and C apartments, I think, are going to continue to have strong demand. Another area that I might mention are RV parks. I know a lot of people maybe haven't heard me speak for a while, but RV parks are uh, the affordable housing of the future. And uh, it, as, as rents continue to rise and prices of houses continue to get less and less affordable, a lot of people, their only housing alternative was to move a, a by, I know it sounds stupid, but it's happening. You just look and see where, where you live. People are buying a camper and moving to an RV park because they can't afford an apartment or a house. Two other trends that I see might happen. I think they might see increased demand for suburban areas. I think the whole urban vibe thing is kind of lost its luster. In fact, if I could short the urban vibe, I do that. I think people are going to want to be out in the suburbs. Millennials are getting older. They're getting married. Geezers like me are leaving their jobs at universities and creating a job for somebody that was driving an Uber that had a PhD, and now they're going to go to work for the university. And as those people get married and have children, they're going to want to move out, and nobody's going to or get this to being cooped up in an apartment for weeks at a time. And I also think it's going to create demand for smaller towns outside the big urban areas. I just think people are learning how to telecommute for one thing. People are learning how to have meetings like this. Even me, I'm actually doing these things. I, I didn't even know 10 days ago, I didn't even know I had a camera on my computer until I pushed a button to go to a Zoom meeting and the light popped on. And uh, now I'm doing these. I've learned how to deposit checks with my mobile phone. <coughs> Excuse me, my cell phone. So bottom line is teleworking is going to be a lot uh, more prevalent in the future. And that means you don't have to live downtown. You don't have to walk to work if you don't want to. And so I'm pretty bullish on about smaller towns near urban areas. And I mentioned that borrowing costs are going to stay low for quite a while. So with that said, Todd, that's kind of the end of my prepared remarks. And, we have a lot. Uh, of if you have any questions that have come in from the audience, I'd be happy to do that. Yep. We have a lot of questions. I hope that you're hearing and seeing me, uh, Dr. Dotzer. Uh, the first one is from me. And you kind of uh, stole my thunder. I've been researching this morning. I thought we we're looking at uh, the you know lost ten years of Japan was going to be our future, and we we're going to have runaway inflation and and way too much stimulus. What? Tell me again. That's not going to happen. Yeah, I know that bothers a lot of people, especially if you're over fifty, um, because. People that are over 60 remember runaway inflation in the 70s. And they've been waiting for it for the last 30 years. The last time we had inflation in America was 1982. How long? Wow. That's 38. We, it's been 38 years where we haven't had significant inflation to worry about in terms of an investor. Here's how you get inflation. Printing money by itself doesn't create inflation. What really creates inflation is when the price of goods start to go up a lot. Now, we're going to see the price of some things go up a lot. I'm guessing right now that if somebody came out with a big supply of safety masks, I bet the price would have quadrupled over the last year. That's inflation for those masks. The price has doubled or tripled in the last couple of weeks. That's inflation too. Why is that inflation happening? Because there's shortages right now. 
Uh, now, what's going to happen is that's a temporary inflation. And I can just see a whole bunch of people getting all excited and going, see, this is when it happens. The Fed's printing money and look at the price of eggs. Look at that. And look at these other things that are going up. They're going up because there's a shortage. They're going up because workers are staying home. They're going up because shipping is challenged right now. Um, and so we do have shortages right now that will create temporary inflation. Do you know why egg growers aren't hatching a whole bunch of new chickens right now though? The reason for that is because they know that when people hoard signal, they're gonna have a refrigerator full of eggs. They're gonna have a house full of toilet paper and they won't need to buy eggs like that anymore. And the bottom of the egg market will drop out like a rock. And so that we're in a temporary shortage of some of these things. But so, so let's say the whole world was nothing but just eggs and the price of eggs tripled and you'd go, yes, runaway inflation for a couple of months. But when the price of eggs falls by 60% back to the normal level, that's gonna be deflation. So in my mind, you cannot have inflation in this country unless you have a shortage of things. And there's no shortages because so many things are made in China and Indonesia and Singapore and Korea, uh, places all over the earth. There is no shortage of supplies of anything. And so once we get back to normal, the, the, the price of all these things at temporary, it's just like lumber in a hurricane. Lumber goes up, sheetrock goes up. What happens to the price of lumber a year after the hurricane? It collapses again. Printing money does not create inflation unless you have a shortage of goods. It's a continuous shortage of goods. And keep in mind, I'm an economist and that means there's a 50% chance anything I say is wrong. Well, that's 50% better than me. We have some other good questions. Uh, I like this one earlier on, uh, asking about uh, an economic one-two punch. So punch one is COVID-19. Is there a punch two? In the, and the person who posted it said, maybe is it corporate debt? Do we have a potentially looming corporate debt issue that puts us into a further tailspin? Okay. Let's generalize that a little bit and say there could be a one, two, three, four punch. Uh, the consequences of this and the, and the government response, our government is doing the best they can, but they have no idea what they're doing. They're hoping that it'll work. Uh, they're hoping that everybody will get uh, $1,200 in the next couple of weeks. They're hoping that every small business in the country will get some kind of small business loan or grant. They're hoping that businesses will keep their employees at work and not lay off and all of that sort of stuff. Just like the unintended consequences of the Fed low and mortgage rates too long. If they hadn't stopped there, they would have bankrupted the whole mortgage industry temporarily. Uh, that happened was when the Saudi prince, uh, decided to produce as much oil as they possibly can and drive the price of oil down to $20 a barrel. That's going to have a devastating impact on places like Houston, Texas and Oklahoma, uh, North Dakota. It's a, it'd be a blessing for other places because gasoline is going to be super cheap. But uh, yeah, there are, there are all kinds of risks to this scenario going forward. And corporate debt is one of them, no doubt. Another question just popped up about, this one is probably near and dear to a lot of people watching right now. Uh, uh, second home vacation real estate. Are we going to see that get bumped and, and hurt by the, all of this? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I don't have a clear answer for that because if you live in an urban area uh, and you want to get away because the urban vibe just isn't as fun as it used to be, 
I could see it. I'm sure a lot of people are living in their in home right now away from where they were working. So it's not clear to me that it will have a negative impact on that yet. Um, some recreational properties though, when you think about who buys a million dollar ranch or a $5 million ranch or a second home that costs that kind of money, there's only a limited amount of buyers. And for a while it was rich doctors. And then uh, Medicare made it, took all the f out of being a rich doctor years ago. And then it was rich lawyers and tort reform took all the fun out of being a rich lawyer at that point. So what that left out of is either hedge fund people that made a lot of money or oil and gas people that made a lot of money. And so I know the doctors aren't going to get rich anytime soon. And I, I know that lawyers aren't going to get rich anytime soon again. And the oil and gas industry is shedding wealth by the minute. So uh, what that leaves is a little different than uh, could have a real slow demand going forward. And it wouldn't surprise me if some of these people in the oil and gas business don't put those properties stock investors and the oil and gas people, when a push comes to shove and you need cash to keep your business from folding up, uh, you might just decide your ranch isn't as useful as you needed to and put that thing out for sale and sell it. So haven't seen that yet, but it wouldn't surprise me in the next year if we don't see some of that. Got another, this is a little deeper, possibly more sophisticated question. Are we looking at uh, another massive infrastructure bill out of Congress after the two trillion stimulus, the additional trillion stimulus they're talking about now. I think that's maybe where you got your five or six trillion number from. Uh, and then if there is an infrastructure bill, what's their effect on our commercial real estate? Yeah, uh, you know, it's interesting. I, for, for the last two years, I said the federal government's not going to be involved in stimulating the economy because they're already a trillion dollar deficit and nobody going to vote for a deficit more than a trillion dollars. <laughs> so it's just stunning how the political will of the country has moved off of that, that we were already running a trillion. Now we're got two more trillion coming through the CARES Act and probably another couple of trillion from uh, infrastructure. Um, I think it could happen. Uh, the, my only fear is I don't know if it'll be any good or not because how long do you suppose it takes to get a bridge going? How many unemployed workers are gonna get a job in a week when Congress uh, passes a bridge deal or a highway deal or a port deal? Um, I, I think it, I think it could very well happen. I think it could be a quid pro quo, you know, it's like, and I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. Everybody that knows me knows since I can't stand either one of those parties and find them to be the biggest blight on our economic future. But with that said, uh, Republicans are interested in trillion dollar debts and the Democrats are very interested in a uh, inter bill. And I think there's political will to go 5 trillion in debt. We'll just find out. I guarantee you, if this virus thing, this uh, social uh, distancing thing lasts longer than June, then we're gonna, I could see that 5 trillion going on up to seven or so. And so that leads into the question, okay, Mark, just how big a debt could you take, boy, before you get nervous about it? And the answer is, I go back to Japan. Japan's debt to, to their GDP is over 200%. Our debt right now is a little over 100% of our economy. So what that tells me is our debt could double and then we'd be like Japan and Japan's currency is still strong as ever, and they have no impact at the level of debt will be when we get to $44 trillion, 
And then when we get to that point, I'll say, okay, let's look at how Japan's doing. Is it bothering them yet? Not really. Their problems, but they, it's their society. They're full of uh, companies that can't fire people. That's why capitalism is cool. In America, you can fire people, at least after this virus is over, and restart. Uh, our, and our country just continuously energizes itself, whereas in Japan, it's basically against the rules to fire anybody. So it doesn't matter if you have any customers or not, you can't fire them. So you have a zombie economy. But the fact of the matter is their debt is 200% of GDP with no inflation and rates at zero. I don't want to be like Japan. But uh, that said, some uh, the bat phone just lit up. Somebody very near and dear to me said, what is your prediction on the effect on the office market for the next couple of years? Well, the office market has been struggling. Um, the high cost of tenant finish uh, suddenly cut up in the last couple of years and it made people a little less interested in the office office market than they were in the past. Uh, I do expect to see some increasing trend in working from home and rem working remotely. Uh, so this has, I could see kind of a longer term structural change in demand for office where people need and want less space than they have in the past. That's not to say that some office buildings aren't going to be great investments. It's what I think is the overall trend out of what we're seeing happen today. Okay, let's go. Last question. This one comes from Paul Ott, a home run question. Dr. Dotzer, if you had the attention of President Trump right now, what would you suggest is the best path to get us forward from here? Okay, I, I feel like I have that answer. Uh, nobody will ever ask me because that's not that doesn't work. Common sense doesn't work. I would tell Trump to enact that War Powers Act and take over the US economy and make people produce respirators, ventilators and masks. He's been trying to be too polite and democracy doesn't work in a war. This is why it's like World War II. When Roosevelt, FDR, when we got into the war after Pearl Harbor, we didn't have Congress debate for a year on some kind of strategy for beating Hitler and Japan. Roosevelt took over the economy. He, you, we didn't make 10,000 B-29 errors because we went to Boeing and said, could you do that for us? And the fact that we're making uh, masks and somehow or other middlemen and wholesalers are pulled of those masks and reselling them at exorbitant prices, that's a crime against the state. That's not a crime against the state, that's a crime against humanity. And if any of that kind of stuff is going on, he needs to take complete control and tell those people to make it and delivery directly on that and see to it it gets to where it needs to be. He, he's got to quit being shy because we wouldn't have beat Germany and we wouldn't have beat Japan if we let Republicans and Democrats in the House and the Senate debate things for a couple of years about what an appropriate strategy.
Okay, hearing nothing. Thank you everybody for your time. I'm gonna leave this screen up for a little bit um, while everyone logs off. Make sure you let us know uh, if uh, you have further questions. Thank you. <laughs> it looks like we lost sound at the very end. I can hear you now. Yeah. We made it almost an hour with no glitches for 3,500 people. I was going to say we, the technology held in there till the last second. Thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon.